One of the questions I get asked all the time is, since you're sucking through the electric supercharger with it off, how much power does it cost? Well, we tested that. It just so happens that when we were first testing the dyno, we inadvertently tested how much power sucking through the electric supercharger cost. And recently I was going through some of that older dyno data and I found it. So let's go take a look at how much power that costs. Before we get to the dyno test, let's take a look at the path the air has to take when getting sucked through the supercharger. So we start out at the inducer, that's the inlet. The inside diameter of the sledgehammer is 3.1 inches or just under 79 millimeters. On the P2 versions of these superchargers, it's three inches, a tenth of an inch smaller or 76.2 millimeters. That doesn't sound like much and probably isn't much in terms of restriction, but in terms of performance, particularly as we approach the choke region of the map, that turns out to be quite a big difference for us. But anyway, that's where the air has to flow into. And no, the impeller doesn't spin, and yes, the nut and that center of that impeller does pose a significant restriction. So once you get to the inside, the air has to follow a 90 degree curve to get to the edge of the volute, and it also shrinks in height down to the periphery, which is 5.75 inches or 146 millimeters. Incidentally, this is the exducer diameter. And then it enters the volute. And the volute looks like a snail. Sometimes these things are referred to as snails, and that's why. And as the air travels through the volute, it eventually gets to the exit of the volute, and the internal diameter of the outlet of the volute is 2.3 inches, or under 59 millimeters. That's surprisingly small. But remember, this is a compressor. And from there, the air goes up to the AccuFab throttle body, which is 100 millimeters. And we know that's not really much of a restriction on this engine. And now let's look at the first dyno pull and that's sucking through the sledgehammer with the sledgehammer off. Hit it. the dynograph from that pole the weather conditions were abysmal it was almost 93 degrees fahrenheit which is like a thousand degrees celsius the barometric pressure wasn't actually bad it was over 30 inches of mercury the humidity wasn't bad but when you take into account the temperature it's pretty bad at 54 percent the correction factor was 1.02 which is basically a two percent correction factor and i'm using sae i've gone on about this before when you see STD here, whether it's a chassis dyno or an engine dyno, particularly on YouTube, I would be suspicious of the person posting videos. I would not trust their numbers because the only reason to use STD is to make yourself look better. That is a correction factor that has been actually superseded by SAE literally decades ago. Industry doesn't use it. The only reason you'd use it is to make yourself look better. So keep an eye out for that. But anyway, we made 270 rear wall horsepower at basically 5,400 RPM. Uh, this is uh, fairly close to where it was. And we were pulling negative 1.64 PSI of boost at that point, as you can see here on this second graph. Now at peak RPM, which was roughly 6,000 RPM, we were all the way down to negative 1.97, which is basically 2 PSI. Now you see how you see this negative 2.27? That's on this sort of return trip graph. And that exists because this was like my second or third pull on, on this dyno. And it was a brand new dyno. It was, you know, in my own place. I was nervous. And basically what that is, is I neglected to stop the data acquisition before I lifted off the throttle. But that's why that happens. Not a big deal. So the best we got in terms of restriction was right around 3,900 RPM where we were down to negative 0.74 PSI. By the way, I'm using boost here because I think that means more to people than KPA, even though we're talking about restriction, not boost. But we're about three quarters of a PSI restricted in our best case scenario. Prior to this, I was sneaking up on opening the throttle um, you know, I did, I did hit the throttle pretty quickly, but 
that just means it's shot through the RPM band up to this point. Now, I do think looking at graphs is useful, but I don't think it really drives home what actually happened during the poll as much as looking at the dyno screen during the poll. And we actually recorded that dyno screen. So let's take a look at that and particularly pay attention to the boost display. You can watch it climb up as RPM goes up because again, take note that Peak restriction does not coincide with peak horsepower. It coincides with peak RPM. Even though the volumetric efficiency of an engine drops off as RPM continues to increase, its airflow needs still continue to increase as RPM continues to climb, regardless of volumetric efficiency dropping off, which happens basically after peak torque effectively, but certainly after peak horsepower. Hit it. And then after this, we disconnected the supercharger's discharge tube so the throttle body was open to atmosphere, and we pulled it again. Hit it! Okay. And the dynograph of that pole is here in blue. And of course the previous one is here in red and you can tell by looking at this bottom graph where the five bar map sensor data is the red one of course is the one sucking through the electric supercharger and you can see the boost restriction at peak power at negative 1.6 psi and we're at negative 0.09 wide open not having to suck through the electric supercharger so basically effectively there is no restriction and all looks good in fact, if you look at where the peak power actually occurred, it was another 100 RPM higher without having to suck through the electric supercharger. Now there's something else that I'm noticing with this uh, converter here now that I can do dyno pull after dyno pull. The power does seem to peak, you know, right around 5,500, generally speaking, when it's not restricted or even with the electric supercharger. And then it dips down, but then it starts going up again, just over 6,000 RPM. Maybe we should try doing a pull a little bit higher and see if the converter is doing something. I have a feeling that maybe if I put in a slightly more aggressive cam, we're going to find a, another power peak somewhere significantly higher, and that's going to be good for everyone. And speaking of high RPM, at 6,000 RPM, we were down to negative 0.01 PSI, whereas sucking through the electric supercharger was almost 2 PSI of restriction. So significantly a huge difference. Now let me get rid of the lower graph because I wanna look at things from a horsepower perspective. If we just look at peak power versus peak power, it's a difference of 54 wheel horsepower. That's, that's quite a bit. But if you go up to 6,000 RPM in this ballpark, you're starting to talk like 65 rear wheel horsepower. That's, that's pretty significant. And as you'd expect, as you go down in the RPM band, the differences are still there, but they're just not as much. It's clearly greater the higher in RPM you go simply because the engine requires more airflow and the supercharger becomes more of a restriction because it's not running. There you have it, two PSI well beyond peak power, or 54 wheel horsepower at peak power on an engine that makes 500 horsepower without forced induction. Hope that answers your question. And here's your moment of Roger. Fast cars, big women and beer. What else is there? Nothing but fast cars, big women and